Assalamu alaikum and welcome to episode 86 of the Sultans and Sneakers podcast. I um, wanted to give a quick um, intro to the show before uh, the release um, for you guys to get some context. So the episode today is with Sheikh Hamza Magbul and we discussed his paper uh, as I guess the backdrop a Malawi's Guide to Gaza and Occupation, something he's been adding to every week uh, for the past several weeks. We recorded this podcast on Sunday, October 22nd, um, and is being released on Sunday, October 29th. I was hoping to get the episode out um, earlier than this, but um, I had some uh, internet issues. Actually, had my fiber uh, internet, which I used to AT&T, was down for about 48 hours this week, and it set me back as far as uh, what I was able to access and get done um, with my internet being down. Uh, you know, it's kind of ironic in a sense that uh, that happened to me as I'm trying to get this episode out about Gaza, and they've had completely all communication, internet cut off. So uh, obviously a lot has happened since the 22nd, um, as and I'm releasing this on the 29th, and as we know, the things things are changing day by day. Just wanted to give some context. Um, also, I wanted to give people an idea of how the show is structured. So the original intent of the episode um, was that I was going to read at least part one of the content of his paper. Uh, he's got part one, part two, and part three. It's been coming out right before Juma uh, the last several weeks. But I was going to, uh, my uh, the original plan, we were going to read through probably part one and part two. Um, but as we were reading it, you'll probably see that um, it was just better to have his commentary. because Rather than have me read it um, verbatim, word for word, and then have him give commentary, People can read it. It would have made for a really long podcast. So we did a little audible. So in the beginning, if you feel like you've read the content already, you've read his paper and you're like 10, 15 minutes in, you're like, I've already read this stuff. Um, just hold your horses. Um, don't leave. Don't leave the show. Just um, stay tight because he gets into a lot of, he pretty much gets into most of the commentary uh, for that the rest of the episode. It's not me just reading. Uh, we kind of scrapped that. We made a little audible um, early on the episode. So uh, hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, and again, if you have any feedback, please email me at info at sultansandsneakers.com. And, um, you know, and then like and subscribe, the usual stuff. Anyways, I uh, hope you all enjoy the show. Episode 86 with Sheikh Hamza Makbur. Spiritual excellence, family, ummah, craftsmanship, and fitness. These are the elements of the deep life. And Sultans and Sneakers is the podcast that inspires Muslim men to live the deep life. I'm your host, Mahin the Podcaster, and welcome to the show. Assalamu alaikum, and welcome to another episode of Sultans and Sneakers. I'm your host, as always, Mahin the Podcaster, and on today's show, I am honored to have Sheikh Hamza Makbul um, actually at his uh, center of learning, Rabat, in front of a probably the largest live studio audience I've ever had. Uh, I think I've had a couple guys sitting in on some previous episode, but I don't think uh, this is the largest crowd. So, uh, first of all, Sheikh Hamza, Jazakallah Khair for, uh, you know, ha having me today and, uh, you know, on to talk about this very important topic. Jazakallah Khair for talking about it. Well, I, you know, uh, when we had talked last week, it was kind of like last minute, uh, weren't able to make it happen. Um, and, you know, my channel is about like this whole self-development angle for Muslim guys and all that kind of stuff, like that pragmatic stuff. And sometimes we look at politics as like, ah, it's... So far, what are we going to do about it, et cetera, et cetera. But then I listened to your khutbah, uh, not this Friday, the, pr the past Friday, where it's like, you know, a lot of it is very pragmatic, the approach, right? And then you, you came out with a, um, a couple of, like, papers. And so I figured a good idea would be maybe we could just walk through these papers, kind of like I'll, I'll, I would read it, and we can just offer some commentary. Does that sound good? Yeah, sure. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get going. Um, so the paper you wrote um, is called um, A Maulawi's Guide to Gaza and the Occupation. Um, before we get into it, I actually want to understand some definitions here. Um, can you explain the term Maulawi? Maulawi is, uh, or pronounced in the Indian subcontinent, usually as Maulawi because of the, you know, proclivity of the local uh, uh, dialects. Um, it is a uh, sifatun nisba in Arabic. Uh, it is an attribute of connection. And here, just like uh, Pakistani is an attribute of connection to Pakistan, and uh, Ameriki is an attribute of connection to America, Maulawi is an attribute of connection to the Mola, which is the Lord. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and so this is, uh, in different places, this uh, expression, it means something different. Uh, in the Indian subcontinent, it's usually a title of uh, respect given to people of knowledge. Um, in the Western lands, uh, it was uh, usually given to a, an acolyte or disciple of Mulana Jalaluddin Rumi. Uh, um, but the point is, the literal meaning is somebody who's just interested in uh, uh, in serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm -hmm. uh, and nothing else. And uh, uh, that's the point of view I'm coming from. I'm not a Palestinian nationalist. I'm not an Arab nationalist. I'm not a pan-Islamist. I don't belong to any political party uh, that I know of, uh, neither here nor abroad. And, uh, um, you know, I don't have a, a kind of a beef uh, or a horse in the race of people's like wars or their like local politics. Sure. Uh, I'm just somebody who teaches fiqh and reads hadith and likes to, you know, sit with the brothers and make zikr and make dua. And uh, this is how I see it. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and start re reading through the text. And then if there's a point in time you want me to stop and like give us commentary, um, just feel free to cut me off. Sure. So the first section, the occupation and dismembering of Palestine. The land of Palestine was liberated, liberated from the tyranny of the Byzantine Empire by the noble companions of the Prophet وسلم, under the reign of Umar ibn al-Khattab. The Christian patriarch of Jerusalem wisely chose to surrender the city to the Muslims, but conditioned his surrender on the caliph, accepting the city's acquiescence personally. In a nearly messianic scene, he had reverently entered the city on foot, traveling by donkey from Medina the Radiant, switching riding turns daily between himself and his assistant. It so happened to be his assistant's day to ride. I say tyrannical because although the Byzantines, as the successors of the unified Imperium of Rome, had accepted Christianity, they continued to desecrate the sacred city and ban Jewish presence until the Muslims came to it. Yeah, so uh, Jerusalem was sacked uh, after the siege of Masada and uh, the Jewish rebellion in, I believe, 72 AD. Um, and uh, basically, the Romans burned everything, destroyed everything, and uh, banned the Jews from meeting. This is interestingly enough. Um, the the Banu Israel used to have a, a body that used to meet every so often called the Sanhedrin, and it had uh, a, a, a seventy-two uh, members and one. Uh, one Amir, basically, and the Sanhedrin, at some point or another, constituted of it was constituted of pious people, of rabbis, and even of prophets, alayhi wasallam. Was so they would kind of meet, deliberate, and uh, decide for things, uh, decisions that were important for the Banu Israel, decide court cases, etc. Um, and the 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 Naib, the Naib Amir was the the uh, also the the the, the judge uh, in court cases. And so uh, one of the reasons that the Jewish calendar is what it is nowadays, which is a lunisolar calendar, and, uh, uh, which is, has a 13th month, an intercalated 13th month, is because one of the threats of, uh, of, of Imperial Rome after that was that if you guys meet again, we're going to kill everybody. And so they had to have a way that they they could synchronize their calendars. Otherwise, they used to also do moon sighting, just like just like we do, from amongst the number of things that they did. But that was uh, a, an, a historical injustice that was never righted until Sayyidina Umar radiallahu who came. And, uh, you know, you can read on and we'll sure. talk about that a little bit. So Umar radiallahu after having accepted its surrender, asked to see the site of the Temple Mount. Finding it still in waste and filled with garbage, he began to clean it personally and had rededicated for the worship of God. He also allowed Jews to come back and take up residence in the land. Which is interesting, right? This is like we're talking about the 7th century and Constantine accepts Christianity, you know, supposedly in the 4th century. So we're talking about centuries of being Christians and still desecrating that, that spot, intentionally throwing their garbage there. The Temple Mount, is that, um, can you explain? That's the haram that the Masjid al-Aqsa sits on. Okay. The entire perimeter of the haram. And it is the Masjid al-Aqsa, which is the, or also referred to as the Masjid al-Qibli. And it is the Qubba al sahra the Dome of the Rock, which is the kind of iconic uh, building, blue building with the golden colored dome. And, and it is the all the courtyards that are around it as well, and the other sacred places. There are a number of other sacred spots in that area. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you get into this later, but like, you know, you have this whole, this whole evangelical notion of like supporting the Zionists. 
um, like what religious, like can you, what's the eschatology that the Christian, the Geese Christians are trying to push for in regards to the Temple Mount area? Yeah, of course I can't, uh, I can't speak on behalf of others, but the general theme seems to be that a certain number of uh, uh, the, the, the Jews have to somehow make it back to the Promised Land in order to usher in uh, the return of Christ. Now, the fun part is that they actually believe that, uh, you know, in the end times, that whoever amongst them doesn't accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they're all going to be, like, slaughtered. So it's a really bizarre, it's a really bizarre uh, uh, relationship that's been cultivated by kind of hawkish Israelis um, who ha command a religious following for their political agenda um, in the sense that they get all the funding and all the, the, the military aid and equipment that they need in order to get that number of people back from a group of evangelicals who don't care much about Palestinians or Israelis, really. Um, but they're just trying to make that happen because they want to meet Christ or whatever uh, in a rush. Alayhi salam wa mimma qalu wa fa'alu. He has nothing to do with uh, these types of detestable actions, especially using uh, genocidal means in order to supposedly uh, meet, uh, meet uh, uh, you know, love and, and uh, grace incarnate uh, in their beliefs. But, uh, you know, I've read articles before about rabbis who come from uh, Israel to go and, like, promote trips and promote fundraisers, because they do big fundraisers and send money uh, to facilitate this process um, in the sacred lands. And, uh, um, you know, rabbis have actually said that when they meet the congregations, like in Texas or whatever, um, they ask them, like, do you have horns under your yarmulke? Like, that's how completely anti-Semitic these people are. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, where interests overlap and then weird things happen. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, in continuing on the text. Previously, when the time of prayer had come in, during his official business in the Church of the Holy Sep Sepulchre, he refused the patriarch's offer to pray in the church, saying that if he prayed there, subsequent Muslims would turn the site into a mosque, breaking the terms of their agreement. He prayed outside of the church, and the site of his prayers is a mosque to this day. Yeah, Masjid Umari is a masjid in the Christian quarter of, of Jerusalem to this day. I prayed in it, alhamdulillah. Yeah. Umar radiallahu anhu dedicated the lands of Palestine as a waqf, or charitable endowment for the benefit of his people, and the Muslims defended it through the centuries at great cost, from the predations of the fanatical Fatimids, generations of marauding crusaders, Mongols, and others, until the aftermath of World War I, when the Ottoman state was no longer able to hold it. Unlike the great cities of Europe, Jerusalem, and the metropolis of the heartland of Islam uh, could boast within their old cities a simultaneous presence of mosques, synagogues, Catholic, and Protestant churches. Yeah, the only, the only, I've been told, Allahu Alam, you know, but I've been told that the only city in, um, in, in Europe uh, that, that has, like, from pre-modern, pre-modern era, an intact masjid, synagogue, Catholic, and Orthodox church uh, are, and I meant to write Orthodox, not Protestant, but... A Catholic and uh, Orthodox churches is Sarajevo. Mm. <laughs> people didn't get along, I guess, you know, back in the day. Yeah. Uh, except for under Muslim rule, people weren't able to get along. You know. Sure. Now, now we fast forward um, to more modern, like the last like the, the 20th century. Yeah. Well, the Allies entered the city triumphantly under British General Allen Beat in, in 1917. Early, earlier that year, the British government had issued the uh, Balfour Declaration expressing its support for a Jewish national home in Palestine. Between then and 1947, Zionists ordered the political movement dedicated to establishing Palestine as a Jewish national home and state, proceeded to facilitate immigration, use their affiliation with the colonial powers to secure and usurp land, and organized themselves into armed terrorist groups such as the Ergun and Le Lehi, both radical offshoots of the larger uh, Haganah the, yeah. uh, militia with the aim of consolidating power. Between a coordinated effort to facilitate the immigration of Jewish communities from around the world and the violent displacement of indigenous populations, both of which, uh, both of which continue to this day, they would go on to consolidate their hold on expanding swaths of land. They would be responsible for the infamous bombing of the King David Hotel, as well as flirt with Italian fascists and even early Nazis in order to do so, as their relationship with the British mandate that established them in Palestine later soured. Yeah, it, they, I mean, they soured. Why? Because they wanted to change the dynamics of the, the demographic dynamics of Palestine faster, the British were t trying to pump the brakes on them because they were sensitive that, hey, you know, look, this is a very, um, it's a, it's a very sensitive place for Muslims uh, and Christians for that matter. 
And, uh, you know, if people figure out what's going on and we do this too quickly, the whole world is going to hate us, which is kind of what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but, uh, but because they weren't allowing them to move fast enough, uh, uh, you know, there's a, little, a lot of duplicitous uh, dealing uh, by that early Zionist community. Uh, and it often turned to violence and really just something that can't be described as anything other than terrorism. Um, again, I'm not saying this out of any sort of uh, personal, uh, uh, personal like love of the British colonial authority and occupation, but it is a weird, it is a weird setup where that this thing was only able to be facilitated through colonization, and uh, in many ways, uh, the, the Zionist movement was. Upset with the British, ironically, upset with the British for not being aggressive enough as a colonizer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there a reason you fast forward to 1917? And because uh, I, I don't think I don't believe you spoke about like Theodore Hertz Herzl and his negotiations yeah. with Sultan Abdul Hamid. Yeah, no, I mean the thing is, I wanted to because the point of the paper, which at some point or another, maybe instead of reading it, we can just like you know, yeah, discuss what's relevant to people because right. uh, you know people don't have an infinite amount of time. Even though it's nice in a podcast to be able to like talk yeah. things long form, right. talk things out because some things do bear uh, explanation. Right. But uh, the point of the paper is to kind of ha help people understand where we are right now. Right. Theodore Herzl, you mentioned him. Uh, he was a pioneer of the Zionist movement, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, he actually at some point or another will make a, a, a substantial monetary offer to sure. Sultan Abdul Hamid. Sultan Abdul Hamid being uh, an upright man and a man of God, uh, 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 you know, not accepting his offer and uh, telling him something to the effect of that, you know, if you live long enough when my empire is dismembered, you'll probably get it for much cheaper than you're offering me right now anyway. I can't accept it. I'm not going to be responsible for selling out the sacred lands on the Day of Judgment. Okay. Yeah. Well, if you, if, you, if you want me to skip forward to a certain part, let me know. Or No, no. I, I, so the, the, the point is like, yeah, so like we mentioned, I mentioned in this uh, uh, history, the point of which is so the people can understand what's going on around us. It's not something in a vacuum. It's not like right. world affairs started uh, because there's like these radical oogie boogie guys called Hamas. Yeah. Hamas that like somehow or another like uh, started like beheading 40 babies at a time mm -hmm. and uh, you know like whatever stripped uh, uh, otherwise well clothed women into bikinis and uh, mm -hmm. uh, whatever supposedly raped them and you know holding a Quran in the hand in one hand and you know parading them through or whatever this other kind of nonsense uh, uh, propaganda that's that's being put out there um, the point is that none of it started then the point is is what that this is a land mm -hmm. there were a lot of people there they used to live with each other. Many of the people who lived in Palestine were Jews, and not all of the Jews were people from the outside. Actually, many of them were Arabic-speaking Jews um, mm -hmm. that are actually people who were, you know, Palestinian. They were Palestinian Jews. And uh, this put them, you know, this kind of outsiders, the colonizers, kind of put them in a really tight spot. This is something I didn't talk about in the paper, but um, interestingly enough, like, the Jews of the world seem to kind of segregate themselves out into, like, a caste system based on where they're from. Uh, uh, not the, the kind of the caste system of the Israelite religion, the ancient Israelite religion, but like a kind of a modern caste system where there is one caste uh, of Jews, which are Ashkenazis, which are people who Ashkenazim are like the, the Jews of European, um, northern and, and eastern European descent. And, um, you know, there's, there's the, the Sephardim who are those that are of Andalusian descent, and there's the Mizrahim that are the, those of uh, descent from the Muslim and Arab lands. Sure. Interestingly enough, right, Netanyahu's Ashkenazi, many of the, many, the overwhelming majority of the most powerful people in Israel are Ashkenazis, right? Um, the Supreme Court, I think all of them, except for one of them, are Ashkenazis. Um, uh, what does this mean? Because, you, you know, like you should know, right, Israelis were about to like, you know, they're at each other's throats just a couple of months ago. In some sense, for national unity, this like uh, uh, event that happened two weeks ago is like one of the best things that could have happened for Israel. Why? Because you have now Netanyahu, who is a political survivor, despite being an Ashkenazi and uh, a relatively impious man uh, for any religious uh, uh, standard. In order to hang on to power in Israel, he has made a deal with a number of different groups that hold him together in a coalition with a, a, a plurality government. His party, Makud party, doesn't have anything near uh, um, majority. And so what happens is that he's promised the the Sephardim and the Mizrahim, the Spanish uh, Andalusian and uh, 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 Jews from the Muslim and Arab lands, things based on their grievances. 
he's promised the Orthodox, the, the ultra, what they call the ultra Orthodox, who is the only demographic in Israel that's actually growing. All the other demographics are imploding. You know, the rich, like liberal Ashkenazi kibbutznik type people, they're all going extinct. Why? Because they're, you know, oftentimes more happy to like marry their boyfriend in Tel Aviv than they are in actually having a large family uh, and studying the Torah. But what happens is that uh, they're less likely also to be settlers. They're also less likely to fight in the government. Uh, sorry, fight in the army. And so, like, there's this tension simmering under the, the surface. Um, all of these things are important to know. Why? Because they lead us to the point that we are right now. So, for example, I'll give you examples. I mentioned, like, there's Palestinian Jews from before. They're actually very disadvantaged by these uh, Ashkenazi outsiders, uh, you know, those who, who spoke Arabic and lived in the land for several generations before, you know, Herzl's guys came over. And interestingly enough, Herzl and the Zionist movement, most of them are atheists. They're not people who actually believe in God. They're Jews from an ethnic uh, 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 and cultural perspective. But religiously, as a Muslim thinks about religion as an aqaid, right? You can't be like, I don't believe in God, but I'm still a Muslim, right? But in, amongst Jews, there, this, is, this line is a little bit blurred. Like, as far as I can tell, the only thing that actually gets you, like, actually kicked out of being a Jew is converting to Christianity or Islam. Other than that, you can be like, I'm like a Buddhist on like, you know, the rest of the week or like I'm an atheist or whatever. It doesn't actually get you disqualified from being a Jew. So they're Jews in that sense. But in a sense that like as Muslims, like you actually have to believe in it uh, to, to be a Jew. I don't, I, you know, I don't think that that's, that's there. But there's all these tensions that are simmering under the surface. And they kind of came to this like really powder keggy uh, uh, type uh, situation we're in right now where... Netanyahu has a bunch of court cases against him, and the only thing keeping them at bay is his protection as uh, you know a sovereign leader of the, the nation, and he's trying to dismember the courts, and who's behind him dismembering the court uh, are people who have gripes with who, with this kind of ethnic supremacy of the Ashkenazi caste of Israeli Jews nowadays. Those are the ones who drove much of the, uh, the settler colonialism uh, 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 that really uh, disenfranchised uh, 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 the Palestinians and treated them like animals, whereas those uh, Jews, the Misrahim and the, the the Sephardim, they have a little bit. They had a little bit more cultural affinity for Muslims. Like, I'll give you an example, right? I used to. I, I was in the Nelk department in the University of Washington as an undergrad, like nothing important or big or whatever. But I remember one summer we had uh, we had a couple of visiting professors over to our house for tea, and uh, you know the Hebrew professor and his TA both came. The TA was evangelical Christian uh, from like North Carolina, and the 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 professor was uh, uh, an ex colonel, retired colonel from the Israeli military. Uh-huh. Alhamdulillah, mashallah. Like you know, people say, oh, anti you look at these anti semites up on this like podcast. No, we had them over for chai, and it was interesting and. You know, they were welcome to come back. The guy, if he showed up even to this day to my house, I'd probably invite him in for tea. Knowing that, you know, he's an ex-colonel in the Israeli military. I invited him over and was cool with that. One of the most shocking things he told me, he says, I'm, we're, we're, we're of Iraqi origin. He says, my, uh, like, mother uh, speaks Arabic fluently as a native tongue. And uh, she, he said that uh, I was born and raised in Israel. And he had the whole Hebrew accent when he spoke English. He spoke fluently, but with a Hebrew accent. And he said one of the... He was, he's told me all these things. Uh, he said, okay, I was trying to be polite. I'm not trying to bring up, you know, like, like Israeli comes over to your house during peacetime. You know, don't bring up the war, right? It's like, you know, like the Salty Towers. I don't know if you ever saw the British uh, comedy show. Whenever he sees a German, he gets like really like like uh, panic. He's like, yeah, whatever you do, don't bring up the war. Don't bring up the war. And, mm-hmm. you know, he inevitably will bring up the war. I wasn't... No, it was cool. He himself told me this. He said that when Israel was founded, they would oftentimes, because the Ashkenazis are usually the commanding ranks, mm-hmm. and the, the Mizrahim and the Sephardis are like lower than them, uh, and so they would tell like the, the Mizrahi soldiers, hey, this such and such house in this place in the West Bank, there's like, it's like terrorists. Go like pull it apart and just get everything and like just completely like check everything and just, you know, arrest everyone, bring them out and this and that. And it would be like a house of one of the ulama. And they knew it. They knew it. He said the reason they would do that is that there was a real fear amongst the Ashkenazim in the the elite uh, parts of Israeli society that if the smack really goes down, 
you know, the war like goes like, because really, to be honest with you, my reading of history, I wasn't alive back then, but my reading of history is that the Egyptians, Syrians, Jordanians, Saudis, and the Palestinians themselves never had a serious attempt at uh, wresting the land back uh, from Zionists. It doesn't mean that individuals didn't put in their full effort. Many of them put in heroic effort and uh, everybody will give their uh, hisab with Allah Ta'ala, you know, according to what, what they did. But they never really coordinated properly. They never put in a good faith effort. And one of the proofs for that is that the highest uh, um, uh, casualty rate that was inflicted uh, uh, on, on the nation of Israel was what? It was by uh, some like bootstrap, like uh, uh, concentration camp, like ragtag gang. Um, at the weakest that they, the Palestinians ever were while fighting Israelis at the power, most powerful that they ever were. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, he, he was mentioning this is that there was a concern that if the smack goes down, the Mizrahim and the Sephardim are going to side with the Arabs against the Ashkenazis. So they wanted to, they made things in the Israeli society such that they on purpose wanted to make fights between them in order to make the relationship between them antagonistic. So that the Palestinians actually hate the Sephardim more, they hate the Mizrahim more, the Mizrahim hate the Arabs more, the Sephardim hate, and they were very successful in that. So this gentleman was telling me that it's disgusting and the, the policy is really like in some way, even though they're successful, but they continue to this day, that's why I, I kind of bailed out and I don't want to live in Israel anymore. Uh, and I've heard this from actually a number of Israelis. This is important to know why, because you have to understand how we got to this point. How you got like this kind of super fanatical group of people who are like, yeah, like they're all animals, let's just all kill them. That this was not all Israelis, not all Jews. Um, this was a faction of them, definitely. The massacres in the paper that I mentioned, you can put up the, in your show notes, you can put up the link. People sure. can read it on their own time. Right. But the, 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 you know, the massacre in Deir Yassin. Yeah. Uh, and the other kind of uh, the other kind of tragedies that that the Nakba was uh, uh, was was comprised of, like Haifa, Jaffa, Jaffa is what now Tel Aviv is, right? These were like big Muslim, big Arab cities, you know, yeah. uh, Haifa. Uh, but like now they're so predominantly Jewish that a person doesn't even associate them with their with their uh, Arabic names anymore, uh, uh, nor do they associate them with Islam or Muslims anymore. All of it was through this genocide and ethnic cleansing. And uh, uh, David Ben Gurion, uh, uh, you know, their first sovereign leader and the, the one that the airport's named after, um, he said this explicitly as much, and you can find the quote. I don't know it verbatim. You know, if I'm going to memorize something, I'm going to memorize the Quran. I'm not going to memorize Ben Gurion. But he said this much verbatim that history gives you opportunities to do these extraordinary things. What he says extraordinary, he thinks genocide. Yeah. Uh, and so, like, we have to, like, make sure when we get it, we have to strike while the iron's hot. And my reading of this particular, this, this, this thing that's happening right now, that's happening right now in, in Gaza, is that uh, there's a miscalculation by a guy, uh, Netanyahu, whose back is against the wall uh, legally, and whose back is against the wall politically, and who has really a, a narrow set of options. Uh, American presidents are all pretty good at figuring this much out. They're pretty good at, like, uh, when their po popularity ratings, like, dip. They're pretty good at realizing, oh, yeah, we need to like go to war now uh, uh, on an unrelated note, which is one thing, you know, credit where it's due. Trump didn't do that, mm -hmm. you know, despite his popularity dipping pretty badly at some point. But he didn't do that. Uh, uh, and it's one of his f very few things that I'm going to say good about him. But he didn't do that. But many others did it. George W. Bush did it. A lot of people did it. At any rate, he's he's in that in that space right now. And he's trying to seize another such opportunity. Um, and it's not happening because the world isn't looking the other way. And I've not seen so much pressure, so much pressure on the media and on the leaders of the world um, to call in every single favor that they had, to put in every ounce of influence, every ounce of coercion, every ounce of, uh, uh, of whatever, whatever uh, cred credibility that they have with political and with media leaders to so one-sidedly spin the story. And it's just not spinning. It's just it's just not happening. People in the State Department are uh, are fed up. Staffers on Capitol Hill are fed up. You know, the, the media tries to lie so much, but the lies are not like lining up. Uh, um, and social media has now made it like comical because you can see the news story being reported. And even before the, the story like gets even 10,000 readers, it's already refuted. You can see, oh, look, you know, the Hamas terrorists did this, that, and the other thing. And already there's like a guy showing, like, by the way, this is a, 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 a an AI-generated image. Just zoom into the hands and things like that. You'll see everything is malformed. 
you see all of that happening. That this, the history that's there. One of the particular things I want to point out is that تحسبهم جميعا وقلوبهم شتى. People think that this is like some sort of united front from an invincible enemy that has like some sort of master plan, protocol of the elders of Zion, and that's anti-Semitic. That's actually I don't even believe in that. You know, we're not anti-Semites. We don't have problems with Jews. We have problems with like genocidal maniacs that happen to be Jews, yeah. but we don't have problems with Jews. And I don't believe that Jews are some sort of like massive, like invincible X-Men level conspiracy. But rather, you think that they're all together, but they're not. They're split into many factions. There's a number of motivations, motivators that are driving different groups of people to do the same thing. The evangelicals for their reasons, the Mizrahim for their reasons, the Sephardim for their reasons, Netanyahu for his reasons. And on top of all of that, you have this like massive push and it's just not happening. What's not happening? The thing that they're trying to do, which is the Ben-Gurion's model, which is to use uh, unprecedented circumstances in order to do like extraordinary things, i.e. genocide, and it's just not happening. So do you, um, w- what's your explanation of like, because there's a lot of theories out there about um, how, how, how is Israel so blindsided by what happened on, on, on uh, the 7th of October, right? And it, the, ar- the argument that I've seen that makes the most sense is that like, I don't know if you're familiar with that, uh, Sammy, Ham- Sammy, Ham- Ham- Hamdi, uh, Sammy Hamdan yeah, yeah. from the UK. True. And he's basically like, listen, like Netanyahu, he, you know, he's kind of like, he's working on these relations with Saudi Arabia, the UAE, normalization, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. He feels like, oh, the Arabs are not back in the, uh, Palestine. They don't care about Gaza. I don't have to worry about it either. I'm eventually working on this stuff. And he kind of fell asleep at the wheel. And from the Gaza side, it's more like, well, we've always, it's, it's like you're always getting bullied. Yeah, and you see an opportunity, and you're, you're gonna go take it. I mean, look what you what you what Sami Hamdi said. Forget about Sami Hamdi for a moment, right? Yeah. Um, he says stuff I agree with. He says stuff I don't agree with. Uh-huh. Even if I agree or disagree, you know, he's an expert in his subject matter. So, right. like, yeah. whatever, right? Sure. But like, I've seen interviews by, uh, um, like, alt media. Yeah. Um, you know, Judge Napolitano. Yeah. He used to have a show on Fox. He got fired for some other. What he's still a Fox guy is the point. Yep. Uh, pro small government, pro limited government, anti uh, uh, LGBTQ, you know, pro pro life, all the same kind of standard Fox stuff. I think he got fired for some, you know, uh, uh, for some HR uh, matter for like uh, harassment of like a, a female employee or something like that. I'm not 100 percent sure. Like mm-hmm. I'm not casting this version, but there, sure. there's something like that, which was why his show was discontinued, and it wasn't like discontinued with fanfare. It was just kind of quietly shelved. Uh, so he's very much still like a like a super conservative uh, type figure. He on his show uh, had Scott Ritter, the former UNSCOM inspector, who's like a Midwest corn fed uh, uh, good old boy. You know, I met him uh, when I was in college, uh, um, and uh, all I can say about him is that he is definitely not a Muslim and definitely not a Palestinian activist, but he's a man who has you know he's a patriot, he cares for America, and he whatever sense of morality he has, you know, he tries to stick by it, which caused him to not do well in the intelligence community. But he was a, you know, he's intelligence community. There are other, like, uh, intelligence people that he's had that are bona fide, like, experts in the matter. All of them, their conclusion is the same, is that even though people are spinning out conspiracies, like, oh, they set it up on their own, you know, in order to, like, you know, be able to do genocide. I don't think any of that is the case. I think part of it is what you said. I think part of it is also that, uh, interestingly enough, uh, with AI and with everybody having a phone in their pocket. Um, and so everybody records every single thing everybody's saying and doing all at the same time. Uh, so, you know, a person who has like a stingray could probably like, you know, see hours of footage of me scratching my butt in my own bathroom or whatever, you know, because because the phone, you know. Mm-hmm. But the, the paradox of all that is what is when you have so much data on so many people, how are you going to sift through it? So they depend on AI instead of doing intelligence the proper way. And uh, ironically, mashallah, look, all, all the Molanas and Movies have been telling people, like, put your phone away, put your phone away, you know, uh, uh, for so long. Ironically, because these people are so, in Gaza, are so blockaded, and they literally live in an open concentration camp. Ritter said that, not me, mm-hmm. you know. They literally live in an open concentration camp. They're being starved to death. They're being denied education, food, water, all this other stuff from even before, like, from even before any of this happened, right? Yeah. Um, because of because of all of that, they had to plan everything super low tech, 
and because of the over-dependence on the ubiquity of their uh, of, of Israeli intelligence through technology, they were kind of totally unable to see it coming. And I think this is great. It's wonderful. Like, as a, we should take a lesson from this as a Muslim man. Your social media, forget about Twitter and you know or X or whatever. It's people like yeah, Elon doesn't ban you like uh, like Zuckerberg does. Forget about all of that. Your social media, you wanna you wanna spread the word. Go to Juma, dude. You know, go to go to go to go to Tablij Jama. Go to um, you know your your you know weekly zikr, your weekly halakha. Go to Isha. Go to you know talk to people from the world and find out what's going on. Go to Hajj because uh, uh, the, you know they they relied on the tech way too much and uh, that's why they got completely blindsided. They had no idea it was coming. Gotcha. So like you know, sk- skipping ahead. So we talk. A, I, I think you. Th- there was um, a point uh, that you made. I, I noticed when you posted on Facebook, some people had some aversions to uh, some of your commentary as far as regarding Hamas and whatnot. And that's a question we get asked a lot. Like, I and actually, I remember uh, a former co- colleague of mine had asked, uh, sent me a text out of the blue, like, "Hey, do you believe Hamas is a terrorist group?" And I kind of was pretty pissed off. I was just like, uh, "No, I, I believe Israel is a terrorist group." And you know, like, well, I feel bad for both sides. I'm like, this is not, and I, and I feel like looking back, I came to, came at him a little harsh mm-hmm. because this is like the average American is just gonna be fed. They're they're not like really that deep, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, they're just like living their life, going to work, sure. see some of the news. You know what I mean? They see people get they they they, they feel bad, but in a sense, they're so numb to it, right? Yeah. And they only know about it because it gets on the news. I mean, there yeah. was a news article, um, uh, uh, not a news article, but a local TV station after the uh, the uh, October seventh, what happened? Mm-hmm. They, they were down in Bridgeview, and, yeah. and they were doing a little um, segment outside of El Baladi, and they were talking to one of the, um, you know, they were talking to one of the... Um, the Hamas uh, versus Hamas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and, and, and they, they, they had said they had spoken to one of the, the waiters there, and, you know, he was like, every time he gets a chance, when he sees someone who's not, not from an Arab background, like an American, yeah, he, yeah. you know, he always, like, chimes in. He'll, he'll be friendly. He'll be like, hey, by yeah. the way, are you aware what's going on in the, in the Middle East and stuff? Yeah. And he's like, most of the time, they have no clue. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? And so all of a sudden now, they're, it's in the news, and they're, they're asking us this question. So we're like, where y'all been? This yeah. has been going since 1947, all this stuff. Yeah. And, and and sometimes, and I, I, myself included, I think I know a lot of my friends, we've come at people who probably have we had a good relationship. We came at them sideways. Yeah. Right? Um, what's your advice to that approach, or how should we approach it? Because, um, especially with, with this, um, you know, because the, they want to interject Hamas into it. Yeah, yeah. And most of us, honestly, I, I'm not super aware of it, right, mm-hmm. of what Hamas is about. But a year, you're kind of at this point, you're like, well, listen, I'm not from the region, um, but you see people, um, it, it's not just Hamas. It was a, a, an entire coalition of Palestinian resistance, sure, right? Um, and they're trying to use it as framing. And it's uh, that's the whole thing. You're trying to, like, change the framing. You're not wa- trying yeah. to get sucked down there. But, what, what, but, but you actually are... You, I, I wouldn't. You definitely point out your issues with Hamas in the paper, yeah. yeah. And and some people had a problem with it. So, yeah. you know, with all that being said, uh, so know. I, you know, I, there's a couple of things that should be mentioned in this, uh, right. In this the, this discussion. Yep. The first thing you said is the issue of framing. Yeah. This is one of the reasons that this discussion is kind of tucked in to the middle of the paper because this is not about Hamas. Anyone who thinks this is about Hamas is an idiot, right? Mm-hmm, right. Uh, this is you know uh, Hamas. It's not about Hamas. Um, it's about the occupation. Yep. Like you said, it's about the occupation. It's about 2.3 uh, uh, you know, million people who don't have food to eat and who don't, don't have electricity for decades. Not, not since just the 8th of October, 7th over here or whatever. But since you brought it up. Yeah. And it is relevant, even though it is a smaller piece of the puzzle than, than, uh, uh, you know, uh, than the news is trying to make it out to be. You have to understand... And I, I make a disclaimer here that support for Hamas, whether it's material or whether it's uh, uh, in like encouraging people to somehow like uh, support them in speech or whatever, it's illegal in this country and uh, I'm not doing it. And if anyone wants to construe something I'm saying or doing as that, it's not that at all. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, that's the second thing I want to say. And I encourage all of your viewers who are in uh, jurisdictions where that is the case to abide by the the law because by mouthing off you're not going to help them you're definitely not going to help yourself mm-hmm. uh, when i say them i mean the palestinians you're not going to help them and you're not going to help yourself if you were actually trying to help hamas you're not going to help them either w- what, is, mouthing w- off. W- what does that actually support because it seems like people in general are in america yeah. are supporting hamas like yeah. if you think about it but how how's that how is that defined if they are 
I'm not participating with them. How now that, that that disclaimer is out of the way, let's right. get to it. Let's yeah, talk about sure. it. You know? It's a podcast at the end of the day. We don't have to do a com- commercial break in two minutes. Right. It's an important thing to discuss. You have to understand a couple of things. One is that it's not about Hamas. The second thing you have to understand is that Hamas itself, right? You know who supported Hamas more than you or me ever did? The Israeli government. I remember, this is one of my first memories of the internet. Mm-hmm. Okay. I remember sitting in the seventh grade in my seventh grade class in Blaine, Washington. Okay. Mm-hmm. Using Gopher. Do you remember Gopher? No. Do you remember? This is way before Netscape existed. This is before Internet Explorer existed. There was something called Gopher. It's basically like the Internet. Imagine the Internet. It's like an outline. And so, like, you know, you just go to chapter A, chapter this. This is about this. This is about that. And you can, like, dip deeper and deeper and deeper into it. That's what it was. So I came across, and honest to God, I had no idea any of these things, what they were. I came across the Hamas Manifesto in, 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 on the Internet in the seventh grade in the classroom. At school, and go for it. I'm like, oh, wow, man, these guys are like Quran and Sunnah, and they're like pro-Palestine, and they want to resist the occupation. That's amazing. You know, like, it sounded amazing to me, right? Then afterward, like, reading more about it in the next couple of years, I realized, wow, Hamas was actually, like, basically, its kite was, like, puffed into the air by the Israelis because they wanted to divide the, uh, divide the, uh, uh, the Palestinian camp politically, mm-hmm. right? So, am I in favor of Quran and Sunnah? 100%. Am I in, in favor of an occupied people bickering about, like, you know, being free uh, when they should be united? I'm probably not. Then later on, theologically speaking, I see, like, the groups that Hamas is associated with, and I'm like, wow, their approach to fiqh, their approach to aqidah, their approach to tasawwuf, their approach to a lot of these things seems to be kind of, like, different than what makes sense to me. Okay, I'm not even going to say bad about it. I'm just saying it's different than what makes sense to me. So I'm like, you know, I'm not, the point is I'm not, a, actually really I'm not all that much of a supporter of them. Mm-hmm. Netanyahu himself used to boast about we're the ones who made them, we're the ones who supported them. What ended up happening, they made them in order to be a fitna against the PLO, which is now what they call the Palestinian Authority. And it earned them what? Blowback. They're the ones who sponsored uh, elections. Uh, in the occupied territories, guess who wins? Hamas wins the elections. The, the Palestinian Authority is like, whoa, you know, we're going to hold on to power over here. But they couldn't af- enforce their the stealing the election. You know, they couldn't enforce it on on the Ghazawi people because a proportion of Ghazan people were that that actually like, supported Hamas as like a political party was higher. Otherwise, it's the same banking system that you know was sending money there or allowing money to be sent there. The same Qataris that were sending money to uh, 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 Gaza to the Hamas leadership with the acquiescence and the knowledge of the Israeli government uh, very relatively recently, right? So if you want to say, oh, you're supporting Hamas, you're supporting... No, actually, you guys are the ones who support... You guys made Hamas, uh, and you're the ones who funded Hamas, and you're the ones who supported Hamas. We didn't know or care about any of them. To us, it's just Palestinians who are resisting. If you're going to keep like 2.3 million people in a cage, not going to feed them, not going to give them water, not going to give them electricity. You're going to control their internet, not let their kids go to school and things like that. It could be Hamas, it could be Hamas, it could be it could be whoever you want it to be. It could be the Palestinian movement for like the adoption of uh, stray animals. You know, it could be the Palestinian movement, Buddhist movement for the adoption of stray animals. Anyone you do that to, mm-hmm. they are going to fight. They're going to resist for their own survival and for their own human dignity and for their own freedom. And that's the actual that's the actual discussion. Yes, I mentioned in the in the paper. Mm-hmm. You can read the quote if you want to. I've actually edited it since then, but it's tantamount to the same thing, which is what? It's very possible, I'm pretty sure that something or another, out of all of the things that happened on in that raid, something haram must have happened, something illegal must have happened, someone should must have been like, you know, some property must have been destroyed that shouldn't have been destroyed. So, you know, like the, that woman, the old woman who was, you know, saying like, yeah, they weren't violent with me. They were nice to me. They were nice to my children. And they asked me if I could have a banana. You know, they shouldn't have asked her for, I don't know. You say whatever you want, right? So you right. can say something happened. The art of persuasion, because I don't write papers for the choir, uh-huh. right? I don't have a choir. Very few people might like me. Even my own children and wife don't like me. You know what I mean? Uh, hi, everybody at home. Like, the, the thing is, everything I write, everything I say is what? Persuasion. Mm-hmm. That I have a point, I believe it's a moral point as a Molawi, which is why I mentioned that in the beginning and the end of the guide, that this is the this is what the Lord wants from us. That as a Molawi, 
look, you're saying Hamas did wrong stuff. I'm like, look, they, okay, you know, they did wrong stuff. I'm going to be charitable, you know, in my argument. Still, let's punish the wrong stuff they did. It doesn't justify all the other stuff, and it definitely doesn't justify you making spectacle that, that we can't talk about any of that or we ignore that larger context. I can understand and I actually respect people who are upset at me for saying that. Why? Because their argument, as far as I can tell, is like, look, forget about them being Hamas or not being Hamas, okay? They're occupied people and they're fighting for their freedom. Why do you gotta, why do you gotta say bad about them? And all I say in my own defense is the point of it was not to say bad about them. Okay. The point is, even if all of these things were true, deal with them in their context. Don't let it be like a, a kind of like a wild card, like a, you get a star in Mario Brothers and you can just run through and like start like bombing uh, children and things like that. You know, that's that's what I'm, the point I'm trying to make. Okay. And, uh, 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 you know, as far as I can tell as an American, you know, as an American, we can say people can fight for their freedom. People who are oppressed can fight for their own liberty. People are caged, you know, without having committed a crime. When, uh, you know, faced with a tyrannical government, they have the right to stand up for themselves. So everyone who does that, I 100% support them. And I don't, I don't uh, want to take the wind out of their sails. But, but if someone did something wrong in that process, the wrong thing is still wrong. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I want people to – because this whole idea of like the, what de, what defending Hamas entails, I think it's a really important point. Yeah. Especially if it has legal implications, right? Yeah. So I haven't been in these rallies, right? I don't know. If sure. You, you know, but um, I'm not sure if these rallies – if, you know, because the rhetoric so – so I'll tell you, like personally, when – you know, in my previous ideological iteration, mm -hmm. um, you know, it was pretty easy for me to say about Hamas because I think there's a fatwa. I think I, – I, I remember reading a fatwa from one of these mashayik about, you know – Hamas is like, you know, a hobby group, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? So sure, it was easy. Yeah, 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 yeah. sure. Um, no big deal. And then I kind of like, you know, what that was like 15 years ago now. So now it seems like in the media, you have people like going on, like like Bassam Yusuf goes on, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Piers. Yeah. And speaks about. That was brilliant, by you know, the way. Yeah. Even though, even though before that, it may not have had so much nice to say about that guy. Yeah. But he, the way he handled himself in the couple of minutes of that interview were brilliant. Right. So you see a lot of normalization, like idea of Hamas being people being okay with Hamas. No, but he wasn't. That was the beautiful part. He's like, "You want me to condemn Hamas?" And he said, "F Hamas." Yeah. But he didn't say F. He actually said the word. Yeah. And to the point where Pierce actually had to tell him, "Look, you know, like mm -hmm. it's uncensored, but mm -hmm. if you do this too much, we're yeah. gonna get like taken off the air or like fine, you know." Right. But he said it. You know, I I wouldn't say because we don't use language like that. Right. right? But right. you know. Uh, just to be very fair, the point is, he said, like, imagine, imagine a world in which Hamas didn't exist. Okay, he goes, that world is the West Bank. The West Bank. Yeah. You know, is a brilliant argument, mm -hmm. right? He's the most anti-Islamist guy, like, out of all of them. He literally sided with CC in order to get get the democratically elected uh, president Mohammed Mursi, who, I, personally, I I think he he was a, a man who was killed uh, uh, in zulm. Mm -hmm. You know, they they transgressed him. You know, I just think he was a bad president. I don't think they had the right to kill him. Yeah, they didn't have the right to overthrow them. They should have waited till the next election, right? Yeah. But uh, but you know, so I'm not, I'm, and I'm not. So the point is, I'm not like Team Mercy. Or, and if you don't like me for it, I'm sorry. Like you know, okay, then hate me. But the point is, even me, Bassam Yusuf was in favor of removing him through the military because of how dim his view is of how much role religion should play in the public sphere. But even with him, he understands the score he knows that this is not about this is not about hamas this was any person who had any like basic human dignity would have done exactly the same thing it's not about them mm -hmm. it just happened to be them in some capacity which is exaggerated and lied about afterward but it happens to be them okay but i still i i still try i'm trying to understand this the question about like what does it mean to def like support them in the american like an american person yeah is saying it you know now now i guess you're right you have to literally say I support Hamas. That's illegal, or I don't. I don't know what what constitutes the legality. I mean, that's for, a, for that's people a, who like are that, you know because that's right a now great people, question for a lawyer. Yeah, 
Okay. You I'll, know what I mean? I'll have to probably ping Hassan it's, Shibli. It's a, no, huh. it, do, do go ahead and ping him and ping other lawyers who yeah. are specialized in this. This is the mm. thing with lawyers. Yeah. Lawyers are so useless, mashallah. <laughs> so so useless. You need something. Mm. You're like, oh, it's not my specialization. You know, I got to, they, they gave me a speeding ticket and I wasn't speeding. I'm sorry, I specialize in stop signs. Like, you know, like, <laughs> so you go, they'll also do this to you. But, you know, go find a lawyer that uh, specializes in this and definitely talk to him. What I can tell you as a Hamza, yeah. as an astute student of human behavior and pol- politics right. uh, and a student of the law, albeit not of American law, sure, uh, is that you can be 100% sure whatever the legalities of it are, okay. they're going to maximally, maximally uh, uh, overextend whatever the Allah allows in order to throw us under the bus uh, as Muslims in America, where as they're going to give maximum leeway to some of these other uh, terrorist groups and banned groups, even within Israel. Um, what's his name? Ben Gavir. Uh, you know, who was the, like the head of like security in Israel, like completely asleep at the wheel. It's all these weirdo settlers who are trying to like uh, settle their own uh, scores against like whatever, like Palestinian children throwing rocks. That's why yeah, yeah. that's why the intelligence failure happened is because they had incompetent people at the wheel. But at any rate, um, you can be sure that he literally belongs to a terrorist organization and our, our uh, government didn't say anything about him being given a ministerial post. Um, you can be rest assured that whatever the law rights it gives us, that it's going to be truncated. And for other people, it's going to be expanded. And so we just have to be careful. And the fun part about this, and this is one of the things I said in the khutbah, I say it in the paper, and I say it to anybody I can see and talk to. Your job is not to liberate Palestine sitting in America. Okay? You're not Rambo. You know, you <laughs> didn't prepare for that. It's not legal. All that other stuff. It's not your job. Okay? Right. Theologically, if it's your job, Someone might make the argument, you know, but uh, it's not it's not going to happen. It's not practical. Okay. And Islam deals with things that are realities and practicalities. You, you do want to aspire to it. That's up to you. Go talk to your sheikh about it. Don't talk to me about it. Your job as an American Muslim and your job as an American American who's like not a complete scumbag, you know, not a complete like like spineless weasel that like sees like genocidal wet dreams is that you need to talk to your fellow American and not convince them that they need to be on the side of Palestine or that, that Zionists are scum or horrible, any of those things, right? Don't oversell your point. All you have to do is look. They're bombing children. Here are the pictures, okay? They're bombing hospitals. Here are the pictures. Oh, well, that one was a, a Hamas rock. No, it wasn't. But imagine if it was, right? Yeah. Um, they bombed the same They bombed the same one like the day before, and they bombed like 30 others, okay? I think that count up today was what? That they, they have destroyed, not just attacked, it destroyed 30-something mosques. They destroyed the oldest uh, Christian church in all of Gaza, over a thousand years old, right? And people were sheltering in it, like civilians were sheltering in it, you know? And like, you know, Hamas is like, mashallah, you're going to tell me Hamas is like uh, operating out of like an orthodox church? Come on, man. You're paying for this. Because there's this narrative, oh, you know, people in that part of the world have been fighting for thousands of years. No, 1947 is not thousands of years ago. People were just fine before that, Mm -hmm. okay? Your job is to be like what? Even imagine what you're saying is all correct. They've been fighting thousands of years ago. The rednecks say the craziest of things. Oh, there's blood in the sand and all this other nonsense. I grew up hearing all of it, right? Um, Your job is just to tell them this much, okay? That you cannot afford to take your children, send your children to college, to trade school. You cannot afford to rent. You cannot afford to take a vacation. You cannot afford to pay your medical bills. You can't afford medical insurance. You can't afford taxes. You can't afford a goddamn thing. On top of it, the do- dollar is depreciating every day. And they're trying to convince you that the reason it's depreciating every day is what? Is because of inflation? What is inflation? Inflation is not happening because they're paying you $15 an hour instead of $7 an hour at Starbucks. Inflation is happening because we borrow money and then to pay the interest money, uh, pay the interest on the money that we borrowed from before and to pay the money back we borrowed before, we print new money, which devalues the money that was already there from before, right? President Joe Biden literally just got on TV and looked America in the eyes and said, I need a hundred billion dollars for two new wars, even though the previous two wars were a complete blank show. Because we don't curse on sultans, sultans and sneakers, right? It was complete blank show. It was a complete crap show. Mm-hmm. We didn't we didn't do anything except for buy the Taliban a bunch of like 
free weapons and armored vehicles and a bunch of really cool bases and, uh, um, you know, allow some farmers over there to grow opium for a while. Okay? That's all we did. And all we did in Iraq is hand it to Iran. Yep. We handed it to Iran, sure. who was supposedly our worst enemy, right? Mm -hmm. And for that privilege, we paid trillions of dollars. Do you want to be the person who now cannot send your child to college just so you can kill more babies in what you consider already to be an intact, intractable blood feud from crazy people halfway across the world? You know, 7-Eleven crazy. Like, ee, ee, ee. like, do you want to pay for that? Just let them slug it out like with their own fists. Why do we have to send our whatever 155 millimeter mortar shells? Why do we have to send Iron Dome? Why do we have to send, you know, they had already, if they were going to work it out, if they're going to do peace, 1947 was a freaking long time ago. If they were going to work it out, they would have worked it out by now. At some point or another, you have to realize something's not working. Just cut your losses and move on because America needs to like focus on America. We're busy over there cutting off water to uh, Gaza. And, uh, you know, you know, you know, but we can't have health care. Flint, Michigan doesn't have clean water. Uh, Jackson, Mississippi doesn't have clean water. But somehow or another, every Israeli army officer can uh, can get the same uh, free health care that every Israeli citizen gets. The same free higher education. And we're giving them aid. They should be giving us aid. They're living the life. They're living the dream. They're fighting wars like on all sides and uh, eating our money for free. Uh, uh, for pointless wars that we fund. Why shouldn't they fight the wars? You get the money for free. Yeah, I, you give me enough money. I'll be like, yeah, screw all my enemies. Let's, let, let's kill them all. Like, this is not what we want to pay for. This is not what we want to sacrifice our children's future for. Just to put that much point across and it will end the entire thing. There's a, there's a, there's a talking point that some Americans will parrot. will say that, um, listen, um, Hamas's charter, actually, I've never read the charter. You, mentioned, you no. read it in seventh grade. It talks about the extermination of every Jew. Yeah. Right. Is that is that accurate? It talks about the extermination of every Jew in the end times. Okay. In that sense, even the Christians, the rapture at some point or another, they believe that every non-believer is going to die. In that way, the Jews also like when their Messiah comes, they're going to like enslave all the goyim. So I guess they don't kill us. We just get to be like second class citizens and drink from the other water fountain or whatever. Right. Yeah. You cannot. You know, if you want to, you can judge people according to that. You, you, if you don't want to, you you don't have. To. Basically, everybody believes that in the end that they're going to be like amazing and everyone else sucks, but. More to the point, right? More to the point. They actually walked that position back. Hamas did. Yeah. They actually declared ceasefire and they actually declared that they're willing to work with the Israeli government on having a two state solution. But why would they have to walk it back if it's about eschatology? Is what I'm saying. That's the thing is that, look, one thing is what's going to happen at the end of time. One thing is what I'm going to do. Yeah. I don't think they walked it back. I think they just issued a clarification because okay. in the beginning, you know, you want to get people psyched for something, you got to go and hype. You know, that's politics. Sure. Right? Then later on, they, they're like, okay, but like for what we're doing right now, yeah. that's not what we're trying to do right now. Yeah. Right. Which is true, right? You don't see like elm trees talking to people. You know, the Gharqad tree is not talking to people. You don't see, uh, you don't, you don't, you don't see the Imam Mahdi uh, walking around. You see Imam Mahdi on Peace TV, but you can play the clip, you know, or whatever when you're editing it, yeah. or put it in the show notes. But you don't see that Mahdi coming around. You don't see Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam descending on the wings of angels, you know, with with Christ, with alayhi salam, with the sweats, this is the beads of sweat coming from his brow like pearls. You don't see any of that happening. You don't see Dajjal uh, flying around the world in 40 days and like, you know, uh, none of that's happening. Right When that happens, yeah, then yes, even I'll believe in, you know, politically, like practically, I'll, I believe in all of those things, of course, right now anyway. Sure. Right. And uh, uh, if you don't believe me, go read or listen to on the SoundCloud. I have a recording with regards to our beliefs of the end times but there's a set of like very tangible things that have to happen for that stuff to be initiated and that stuff definitely hasn't happened yet right you know and to like hold them responsible for some eschatology and hold everybody responsible for their eschatological beliefs okay so like the the, the, the argument is framed this way that okay because they want to let's say israel has the power to essentially destroy the palestinians if they wanted to mm -hmm. and the fact that they haven't Tells but they them. don't. Like the thing is, wherever they had it, they yeah. did it. Deir Yassin, they did it, right? Yeah. Haifa, they did it, right? Yeah. Tel, the, the Tel Aviv, Jaffa, mm -hmm. in this port of Jaffa has now just become Tel Aviv, right? Mm -hmm. They did it wherever they could do it. They did it. 
wherever they push the Muslims out of whatever neighborhoods they push them out of, you see like people like settlers, basically people from like Brooklyn and stuff moving into Palestinian like uh, ancestral homes in Jerusalem and like, you know, yelling at them. And you see all that video, you put all like a, a thousand links in your show notes for all sure. of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Wherever they can do it, they can do it. The problem is this, look, killing 2.3 million people. Mm -hmm. Okay. It poses a very interesting and unique logistical challenge. Okay. The Germans, Nazi Germany was, a, a metaphor for efficiency in human history. Okay? Yep. They put their mind to this problem after having unfettered access to be able to kill people at maximum capacity, maximum efficiency. Were they able to destroy the Jews? Absolutely dominating them. Right? Right. Were they able to? No. 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 Thank God they weren't. Yep. God cursed them. Mm -hmm. You know? So what do you think? Israel has that much power over people? They're not God. You understand? Yeah, like we no. said from before, we're not that anti-Semitic ourselves that we believe some protocol of elders of Zion nonsense. They're not God. They are trying their best, bombing uh, hospitals and killing babies and cutting off like uh, water and medicine to like small children or whatever. It's more or less up there with Nazism as far as I can tell. But they're not able to do it. They're trying it right now. That's why we need to get the word out so that they stop so that they don't have that moment that they've been looking for like they've used in the past. Okay, gotcha. And as we wrap up here, final question for you is... Again. By the way, you talked about eschatology. Before your final question, I wanted to interject this, right? Yes. If you look at the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ with regards to the Dajjal, the Antichrist, yep. the place where Sayyidina Isa, where Christ will meet him and, sl and slay him, okay, is a place called Lud. Okay. Okay. Lud is where the Ben Gurion airport in Tel Aviv is. Okay. Okay. So if you want to talk all of, all of that stuff, when you see the Dajjal get, get, get uh, uh, shanked yeah. at the Tel Aviv airport, then you can call all of us up and say, oh, these guys have these like kind of weird eschatological fantasies. It's not happened yet, though. It's okay. gone. Yeah, so I think that the, the final question is like, I think one also practical is they that... They literally call it Lod Airport. Yeah. This, yeah, in like Hebrew. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, my reflection in the last few weeks has been like, there is no singular issue that unites the entire Ummah like this issue. No, I think there's no singular issue that unites the entire Ummah more than the Tawheed of Allah, that there's no God except for him. Uh, but what I will say is this, is that this is, issue is a thorn in the side of Muslims in terms of geopolitics, mm -hmm. and much of it is not our fault, mm -hmm. okay? It's a thorn in the issue of every, a side of every Muslim in America. Like, I know there are people in America, you know, Pakistanis are like, well, you know, Afghans are like, Arabs didn't care when our land got trashed, you know, uh, and, you know, whatever, Iraqis will say, well, they didn't care when I, our land got trashed, and the Libyans will say they didn't care when our land got trashed, and nobody said anything, stood up for the Central African Republic, um, when it was getting trashed by the French or when it was getting trashed by the Wagner group relatively recently. Nobody's standing up for the Uyghurs. People have reasons that they're going to put up to like want to ignore it, mm -hmm. which may not be like pious reasons, but politically, you know, they may have a fraction of a point, maybe, maybe not. And uh, uh, like, you know, African Americans are going to be like, well, you know, the only Palestinians I know, which is sad. This is not definitely not the only thing that's out there, but there are instances of it as well that they run liquor stores in our neighborhoods. Yep. And uh, uh, you should definitely not uh, blame all Palestinians for it. Definitely the poor people of Gaza never opened a liquor store in your neighborhood, but someone from there may have. Uh, um, and you have a right to be upset about it. And I see some of those people, literally they defend it to this day, and they don't understand what the link between these two is, even though to me it's clear as day. At the end of the day, despite all of those pleadings that a person can do that this is not my problem guess what it's still your problem why because the israeli lobby in america is extremely powerful it's the most powerful lobby in america okay some people say the aarp is stronger than that i don't recall the last time the aarp got uh, the old people lobby right the last time the aarp got away with uh, and i'm old let's see my read is white so i'm not hating on old people but like you know i don't recall the last time they got away with genocide yeah right um the Israeli lobby is extremely powerful. The Israeli lobby, whether you like it or not, as a Muslim in America, they made a decision. They made a decision decades ago that Muslims are a target for them, that they will pour in money into the Islamophobia industry. In fact, they're the ones who run it. All the who's who of the Islamophobia industry get major funding from, from, from the Israeli lobby, openly. Right? The Anti-Defamation League, uh, APAC, 
which is the American Israeli Public Affairs Council, um, uh, Jewish religious organizations, not all of them, but many of them, uh, they host many of the many of the synagogues, not all of them, many of them, like m- enough to be really disconcerting, host Islamophobes regularly in order to peddle stupid conspiracy theories, even though every masjid I've ever been to has been open to having interfaith and have sh- actually treated the American Jewish community with a great amount of respect. Some American Muslims do mouth off about Jews, but it's nothing compared to the way the Jews mouth off against Americans. Like, I'll give you a personal anecdote. I actually went to a a, a, a a synagogue in Seattle, and I spoke. Uh, the rabbi was a very good man. I don't know if he'd like me to mention his name or not. He was a very nice guy, actually. We had a number. Of, he wrote a book about the Cairo Geniza, and I read it. It was a wonderful book. That's like a completely different topic. We, you know, you should Muslims should read about. It. It's really amazing, right? So he invited me a second time to speak at his synagogue, and um, and. A woman came up to an old woman. She's like, she's like, I'm gonna, you know, say I'm sorry, and you know, I was kind of, you know, what you had to say was really amazing. I'm like, sorry about what? She's like, well, I'm kind of embarrassed to say, and I'm like, what? What do you mean embarrassed to say? She's like, when they invited you the first time, I was really against it, and uh, you know, but then the second time they invited you, I made a, you know, I thought instead of like making a big deal out of it like I did the first time, I should like come and listen to you. In fact, I wanted to listen to you the first time, but I was scared. I'm like, scared of what? I'm like, what do you mean embarrassed? I had to coax it out of her, like, you know? It's like, I thought maybe you're going to show up and, like, blow yourself up. I'm like, what in the world? Ah, you, you think I have nothing better to do than to, like, cap some, like, like you know, <laughs> Grandma Goldberg, like, come on, like, seriously, like, why? But the thing is, I don't blame her because yeah. that's these people have been like fed all of this nonsense, right? right. It's that same shaitanic thing that like divides Ashkenazi and Mizrahi and Sephar into like weird like, and they just fear of each other and animosity just keeps all of this uh, energy going. And if people like open their eyes, they're like, yo, these people actually aren't like that with us. Um, then things can be better like almost overnight, you know. Yeah. But the issue is what I what I was saying is this is a fact. This is an objective fact to this very day. The Anti Defamation League, APAC. Uh, 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 a number of a number of Jewish uh, Israeli American Zionist American civic organizations have basically made uh, uh, Islamophobia a, a a pillar of their campaign. Yeah, um, a pillar of their public uh, public relations campaign. Like for example, you remember when um, W was running for uh, re-election? Yep. There was an organization that has again very deep Zionist roots, Clarion Foundation. Mm-hmm. They put out a documentary it's just propaganda right called obsession and it was basically about quote-unquote islamic extremism and they sent dvds of it to like every uh house in like swing states what does voting for george w bush versus voting for uh uh, john Kerry? john Kerry? what in what the hell does that have to do anything with with any of it right all of it is what is pushing this pro hawkish pro war anti muslim party Whatever Muslim there, why is Netanyahu trying to get America to invade Iraq? Any Muslim country just bomb the smack out of it. You know, any Muslim abroad at home just completely shut them up, bundle them up, throw them in the sea, like get rid of them. That's basically the the policy. And so, if you're an African American, you have your resentments against against Arabs or against Desis that open like uh, uh, you know. Uh, a liquor store in your neighborhood. I have the same resentment. I hate those people even more than you do because I have to live with them because oftentimes they're they're our own fault, right? But this is still going to be your problem. You're still not going to be able to run away from it. You're still not be able to gonna get, be able to get away from it because when they say we're anti semites and they say we're Jew haters and they say we're terrorists and we say this that and the other thing, like the word terrorist doesn't really mean anything anymore. It's the meaning of terrorist is like all. You can sum it down to that Family Guy meme where the cop is looking at the shade, yep. the shade guide, you know, to see if this person is like a thug or a, 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 or, or mentally imbalanced or disturbed. None of it means anything. You you can have your internal gripes as much as you want to, if you want to. But this issue, until it gets worked out, America is not going to leave us uh, at peace as uh, Muslims in this country. Uh, and so, you know, whatever is not going to end well, it behooves us to like get together and do something about it now, rather than f- let it fester uh, until it gets out of hand. And we pray that it's not already there. You mentioned uh, the relationship you had with the rabbi, right? Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of... I had relations with, uh, relationships with a lot of rabbis. Not relations. That means something else. Yeah. I've had relationships with a lot of rabbis right. uh, 
reform orthodox uh, conservative you know over the years i i do see a trend which is kind of sometimes like where people are using the same kind of rationale that that we are victims of against other groups of people like muslims will equate all they they just won't trust any jew they there's a, oh i got a jewish co-worker he must be like Yahoo. you know this kind of like rhetoric so to there speak. was a rabbi of medina yeah she he, i mean when the Prophet ﷺ called the Jews to, uh, of Medina to uh, uh, stand by their word when they swore a pact that they would uh, mutually come to the aid of one another and defend Medina at the Battle of Uhud, he came, yeah. he fought, he gave his life. You know, the Prophet ﷺ didn't have anything bad to say about him. Right. You know what I mean? You cannot say that. Some of the most upright people of this home, you know, they may not yeah. be Muslims, but some of the most upright people of this home are Jews. Yeah. Look at the look at what happened last Friday. They literally occupied the the Capitol building. If we did it, we would have all ended up in Guantanamo. Yeah, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. But they literally all occupied the Capitol building. They had to arrest them one by one, and they would you know they occupied this. They 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 sat in the streets of D.C. and as the cops arrested one set of them, another set would come in and sit in the streets. So you know, yeah, we don't believe in their religion. They don't believe in ours. Yeah, but uh, uh, as as human beings. You know, making enemies or seeing enemies where none really exist is a completely stupid thing. I don't think it's a, a particularly Muslim trait or quality, mm. and uh, I don't think we, uh, you know, I don't think we benefit from it. Well, at all. and I think the the actually the the point of the the the, the, the largest of the question about unity and stuff. The point I was trying to, or the question I was going to have is, you know, we obviously have a lot of squabbles with a lot of people in our own community, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. And we've kind of put some stuff like on the back burner. It's not like we're like, we're going to ignore it. Yeah. We're putting on the back burner for now. I'm one of them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. Well, let's table it for now. Well, the sad fact is if we don't do anything right now, we may not have a, the luxury of a tomorrow where we can bring up old grudges again. <laughs> right. You know, so, so I, so I think, um, so, so I, so I guess with that being said, like I actually noticed, so um, th th there's a popular activist in America. Mm -hmm. I won't mention my name. I saw, and, um, and there, there, there's a brother in a who um, I follow on Instagram. He was he came at him really hard. He was just like because he he actually quote tweeted something about Gre Greta Thunberg, and he was like, listen, and he was like, listen, um, why are are we just like now promoting every one of their mom that that supports this cause, um, like just blindly and and like and all that with all the baggage mm -hmm. or or what is it? Um, so he and some people could say, well, he's being a little critical of um, you know, because I think right now it's like. People, you know, and I and I think this may be some of the flack you got too with this paper was that like why are you being like it's not the time to be a little critical and I don't think you were critical I think you're just pointing out some nuances mm -hmm. that people like can't need to sometimes when you don't have when you completely lose nuance yeah even in trying times you you might do something stupid yeah right yeah um but like where um with this issue of unity um and we have people who differ with us. Um, and we're kind of putting the back burner. How do we? Is there a lesson when let's let let, let, let let's say hypothetically speaking, a month from now, mm -hmm. Palestine is freed, right? The issues we have these certain individuals. Like, so I'll give you an example. So I don't know if you saw this. I think it's got deleted. Sheikh Omar Suleiman gave the Juma Khutbah at mm -hmm. um at the National Mall on Friday. Sure, sure. Afterwards, some queer Muslim mm -hmm. woman yeah came up to him. And was like, hey, we helped organize a lot of this stuff, but I, w I was not a fan of your navigating differences. Yeah, sure. State statement, etc. And he and he just shied, you know. Uh, I heard she was Bengali too, so I got to take the L for that. You know, collect collective. It's all good. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, you know, he he kind of dodged her and kind of was like, you know, and and she made a big deal about it on Twitter. Yeah, sure. And all that no, kind I'm of familiar stuff. With it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm so. With it. With, with that being said, or this idea, so right now there, there's also post being made. Hey, I'm never going to vote for another Democrat again no. in the elections next year. No, no, all this kind of stuff. The, look, the thing is, this is that you have to be able to. This is one of the stupidities of our community is that mm. they try to seek the aqidah out of politicians and they s try to seek politics out of uh, uh, out of mutakallimun uh, or out of scholars, right? Okay. Um, believe the most pure creed that you know. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have a series on the Aqidah Tahawiyah. Please feel free. You can watch it for free. No two weekend, hundred fifty dollars summer. I'll just, just watch it for free. Uh, 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 or come come to the Rabat and I'll teach you. You know. Um, but if you see someone else has better, I bet if you put a fee on it, by the way, you get more people learning. Well, that's a separate thing. But I'm just telling you, like it's not about that, right? Yeah. And if you think I'm a deviant innovator, then please, by all means, go to whoever 
right. you know, your guy is, and have the purest aqidah possible. Allah Ta'ala deserves no less than that. Sure. Okay? Uh, he's our Lord, and His right over us is absolute. He deserves no less than that. But, now, when you're doing politics, right, you have ad hoc, ad hoc, one issue uh, alliances with people. Like, for example, right, if there's a pothole in the road in front of the the the, the Rebaat, mm -hmm. right? And people are getting into accidents and stuff like that, and people can't park here, and it's a problem, right? Yeah. The liquor store right there, the 7 Eleven right there. Thank God we don't have anything like this, but if it was a strip club across the street, whatever, we're all going to sign the same paper, send it to the city, and be like, hey, yeah. uh, um, you know, uh, fix the pothole, right? Yeah. Is, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, like whatever, Abu Albani bin Baz, uh, al uh, Wahhabistani, like, you know, uh, Al-Madkhali, al whatever, you know, al Tawhidi or whatever, is he going to be like, oh, look, you know, you support? No, but we both happen to agree uh, that on this one issue, it's mm -hmm. an ad hoc alliance, right. right? I don't care who it is. If if Greta and and Barney the dinosaur and Big Bird and Tinky Winky and God knows what you know you know uh, uh, what's the guy that the guy the guy plays piano, not not my favorite artist. What, what was his name? Stevie Wonder. Not Stevie. No, Stevie Wonder is like I'm not making a fatwa about music. I'm just saying he was a talented musician. Mm. I'm talking about the, not Ray not Ray Charles, bro. He's a talented musician. I'm talking about this other the the guy from England. Oh, Elton John. Elton John. Okay? Yeah. I have very little affinity for anything the man does. Right? right? Yeah. At all. Right? Right. But if he was the guy I needed, to, I needed to have a conversation with to stop the children getting killed, oh. you bet I would have that conversation with him. I would say, please and thank you. And if he, and I'll tell you even one more thing. If he did it and if he stopped it, I would respect him for the whole rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't ratify his aqidah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or his lifestyle, or think that his music is any good, or any of that. But on this one thing, I would respect him for all the days I'm alive. Right. Why? Because this is not about any of that stuff. This is about something different. So yes, please put aside your squabbles with other people. If you don't consider them to be non-Muslims, if you consider them to be Muslims, you should be even quicker to put your squabbles aside with them. But even if a non-Muslim was there, this is an issue. This has like a, become a bigger issue than any of that. Imagine that. Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala, Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He making the tawaf around the Kaaba, and he says how how great you are, and how holy and sacred you are, and how how honored you are in the eyes of Allah Taala. And I swear an oath that every one of the believers is more honored in your in 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 in, in, in Allah Taala in in front of Allah Taala than you. And Imam Allah bin Bakri, I don't know if you know him or not. He's like Imam in California, and he like you know goes and speaks, and he does fundraisers for a lot of good organizations. He's doing a fundraiser for my dad in a couple weeks. So you know him. Mm -hmm. He literally texted today. He said today the last Bakri in Gaza has been killed. Their entire family has been wiped out. He sent pictures. Most of them are like 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 less than seven years old. Yeah, for the sake of the Lord, put aside these things. Stop the killing. Stop the stop the murder. Stop the strangulation, starvation. All that. what does somebody imagine? There's like a seven year old kid somewhere that has like needs an asthma inhaler right now. There's a seven year old kid right now that hasn't drank water in like twenty four hours, mm -hmm. right? Until they're getting killed, we don't care. Like, what the hell? You know, just for the sake of the Lord, put it aside. For the sake of Allah, for the love of everything that's good and decent, just put it aside for right now. Do what you need to in order to help stop this thing. And then when it's done, I'll call you a deviant. You call me a deviant. I won't say salam to you. You don't say salam to me. Those are all the, the, the luxuries, the luxuries of uh, 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 and decadences of, 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 you know, being alive and being safe and, you know, being secure. We don't have that right now. Uh, and Allah Ta'ala is not going to, you know, is not going to imagine that you save someone's life. He's not going to be like, oh, why did you shake hands with this one guy? Like, because, you know, like he, he doesn't, I don't know, his one like th belief about this and that is, is, is wrong. I didn't give them. Did I write a, someone a certificate? Look, everyone in Iran now, their aqidah is okay. Sheikh Hamza here. Like, <laughs> did I do that? Right. Even Iran, people who know me personally, I don't talk about it publicly because I'm trying to teach Hadith and Quran. I'm not trying to teach my politics, right? 
but maybe people who know me might think that I don't have such a popular or positive opinion about it, right? If they stopped it, I'm going to have something good to say about them. Right. I'm not going to have something good to say about their aqidah or some of the other stuff, their destruction of Syria, the destruction of Yemen, the destruction of Iraq, any of that stuff. No. But they did this one thing. You know, the Lord doesn't need to send anyone to Jahannam. A man might do only one good deed in his whole life and it saves them on the day of judgment. You know? So let's let people do that rather than obstruct them from, from that. Let's participate in the good that they do uh, instead of, instead of uh, pushing them further into bad. And who pays the bill is like these children. You know, let's do something. I, mean, I, I, I want to thank you also. I want to say to the audience right, that uh, I, 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 I shame grenade and blackmailed you, said let's have this podcast. If you don't want to inter- interview me, I understand. Go find the guy who's going to say something about this and spread the word to people so people can think about this and do something about it. So I also want to thank you. May this be the one deed, Yom Al-Qiyamah, that after all is said and done, all of the, the vain daydreaming about sneakers and about sports and about, <laughs> you know, like, you know, the, making takfir of people back in your old days and uh, all the, whatever you have that you regret and feel bad about the fact that this day you opened up your camera and you opened up your microphones in order that somebody can say something as intercession on behalf of like children who are dying may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive all of your sins may Allah ta'ala forgive the sins of everybody who listened and everybody whose heart is moved and has an intention of doing something good everybody who's happy about uh, tomorrow in which children aren't getting killed and everybody whose heart is grieved with a today in which they are uh, you know, like I want to thank you as well about that. Yeah, you know, uh, in, in wrapping up here, I think when, you know, I couldn't, it was the, the Friday before, um, there was a whole, you know, I, I, I hit you up on message because I was like, you know, you're trying to figure out which which masajid we're going to not talk about this issue, right? Two Fridays ago. I remember the voice note and it was, I, I went to, there's a Montenegro masjid that I sometimes pray at. I was in a, I was in a, on a tight window, so I go there. And they barely let me in because they were like the cops had come right before. And they were like, hey, we heard some suspicious stuff in the area. Uh, we rec- just tell you guys, just be on the lookout for stuff. And if you see anything shady, let us know. I just I just got a message before we started this podcast yeah. that there was a, a pro-Israel demonstrator who fired in the direction of a, a pro-Palestine demonstration mm-hmm. in like Skokie or whatever. Okay. You know, and right. uh, there's, you know, of course, everybody knows about the six-year-old Shahid Wadir. Yeah, uh, 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 and his mother, who were like stabbed multiple times, and it's happening. And you know, if it happened the other way that somebody harmed a, a member of our uh, American Jewish community, I, you know, that's also and a it tragedy happened. as well. Something just happened right in Michigan. Well, the thing is, they don't know about yeah. that. What the what the, the, what, the mo- what the motivation was? She was sure. stabbed in her home. It may have been somebody she knew, right? But uh, you know, nobody, even if it has nothing to do with any of this issue, nobody should die like that. Yeah, uh, especially not our, our our neighbors, our countrymen. And, uh, uh, um, you know, like, that's not what, what we're about. Uh, my, and my kid's school has actually been closed since Thursday because of, like, they, they actually got a... Where did they, they go to Islamic Aksa. school? Well, I, yeah, maybe so so should, they, yeah. they, they got hate mail on Thursday, so they're Probably actually... Long. They took them out for a few days. They're gonna, they are gonna had to redo, redo all the security and stuff. Yeah, I'd imagine the poor kids in Gaza are not going to school. I and mean, for that matter, even the kids in, the, the kids in like, uh, the occupied Palestine, they're all, the, mm-hmm. the, even the occupiers' kids are scared. Mm-hmm, right. You know, like, we don't want to do this to anyone's kids. Right, right. But I think going back to it, it was like, when you, uh, you and you said, hey, when you already know how to do a podcast, and I was like, okay. But usually on these kind of, these type of podcasts in person, it takes a little bit of prep work for me, yeah, yeah. you know, in advance. And I was like, man, I got a lot going so on. So if it's fly by night, if the editing is bootleg, yeah. Jerry Rig, don't hold it against them. It's my, it's my, my yeah. fault. Well, I'll try to do it, get, get it out as quick as possible. You don't get the like Muslim podcaster Emmy. You lose it to like Mad <laughs> no, but 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 one, but, 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 but one thing you said was when, when you when you messaged me, you was like Allah gave you a platform, and I'm like, my head was like, bro, I only I only have two thousand followers on YouTube, man. I'm like one point eight k, and then the next day I was I did a, a sh- did I listen to Sammy. Mm. Sammy was talking about like everybody getting banded together. It's like no matter how many followers, it doesn't matter, right? And I was like, wait a second, maybe what Sheikh said had a point. Um, because I, you know, because I was like, my, my channel is about personal development, like what's this, all this stuff. And then I was like, let me think about it. And then I read your paper, and I was like, maybe we should do some commentary on the paper. That would make sense. Yeah. You well, know what I'm saying? Because I, I was like, I got nothing to offer. I'm not a, you know, whatever. What but. more personal development than that? Yeah, for sure. You speak up on behalf of. Uh, Children being genocided, yep. and the Lord forgives you for so much. Right. And He doesn't need to punish you because you like looked at a girl in second grade or whatever. He doesn't need to punish you for any of your sins. Mm-hmm. Uh, rather, do something that, that that shows yourself that you're worthy of His love, and He already loves you anyway. Right, right. Uh, so uh, I appreciate you pushing me for sure. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I accept it. I mean, I mean, 
For our listeners out there, if you have any questions or comments, you can email me at info at sultansandsneakers.com. Um, what, the website for Ribat is ribat.org, uh, ribat.org. By the way, I've for the last two weeks, I've put these out. You can find it on the blog on the website, R-I-B-T, ribat.org. So I put these guides out for the, which is a digest of what's happening this week in order for people giving khutbah. And at the end of them, there's like a kind of a spiritual message of how you should take this as a Muslim. Um, and I've been told dozens of khatibs, uh, if not hundreds, have uh, read them and prepared from them, uh, as well as hundreds of people reading them otherwise. Uh, and so all of this stuff I do on my own for free. All the work that needs to be done, no one pays for it. So if you want to support, please do... Uh, Mm-hmm. Uh, go ahead and uh, uh, do that at the website also ribot.org forward slash donate support sultans and sneakers what how do you how do they support well their if, podcast? if they want to like first of all like and subscribe and if you want to become a patron financially you can be, be so at patreon.com do that forward slash sultans and sneakers and you have your soundcloud right that's where most of your audio content is yeah correct? soundcloud i have a soundcloud.com forward slash h makbul m-a-q-b-l m-a-q-b-u-l where like all my uh, lessons and, and khutbas are posted online so you you know, do get a double whammy when you're doing your chores or on your daily commute or whatever. Okay. Uh, inshallah. And, uh, All right. Jazakallah khair. Yeah, All right. Yeah. So, I'm listening up there again, uh, for my special guest, Sheikh Hamza Makbul, I'm your host, Mahinda Podcaster, signing off. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.